Okay, um, there were a couple of things. Uh, well, one thing I realized I, uh, in my haste didn't explain perhaps carefully enough, which was uh, in discussing this model. Um, so remember, we, <coughs> we, we first of all make the model for conformal geometry. That's what's in white here. So you take um, R d plus 2, for instance. Xa denotes the standard coordinates. <coughs> um, you fix this Lorentzian signature uh, metric. <coughs> and then um, you get a null cone. Uh, looking, for instance, at the future null cone, you ray projectivize that. You get a sphere. That has a conformal structure, remember, because if you take any section of it, it determines a metric on the sphere, and the different sections are conformally related. Right? So that's all from uh, um, the other day. <coughs> and then we want to look at um, why this gives a model for um, conformal compactification when you add some additional structure. So <coughs> I claim that the right thing to do <coughs> if you want to get the uh, compactification of hyperbolic space, right? So, <clears throat> so this, this is uh, um, how to make a conformal compactification of hyperbolic space using this sort of picture. So, <clears throat> so what you do is you, you pick, um, in, in a sense, a tractor, but because we're in the model, that just corresponds to a constant vector such that, <coughs> such that its length is, is positive. Okay, so its length being positive, <coughs> remember if we're thinking of tractors, <coughs> that would exactly mean the scalar curvature is negative. So this is going to correspond to a metric on the conformal structure with uh, the scalar curvature being less than zero. <coughs> so here is, here is such a vector. So zero, zero is one. So in here that'll have positive length. <coughs> that then determines this distinguished uh, linear polynomial. So we look at the sections of this <coughs> that this gives of the cone. So <coughs> um, if you take the zero locus of that polynomial, then <coughs> it doesn't give a section of the cone, it gives a subcone because it's just, it's just knocking out one dimension. In fact, with my specific choice of i, it would be just taking the last coordinate out, <coughs> okay, and setting that to zero. So you get a subcone, and therefore when you do the ray projectivization, that subcone gets a conformal structure. <coughs> so that's your boundary. It's going to be up infinity. That's the conformal structure that you get for the same reason that we got a conformal structure on the whole thing. So you're just doing it one dimension down. <coughs> on the other hand, this is a conic section. So, <coughs> so the, the metric induced on this section is a hyperbolic metric. So we're pulling back that induced metric on here to this hemisphere, <coughs> and as I said, every ray, null ray generator on this side of this uh, hypersurface will intersect that in, in a point. So we definitely get a metric um, at it, everywhere on this side of this hypersurface in the sphere, and it's a hyperbolic metric. And then it's easy to show that, in fact, <coughs> this hyperbolic metric, and that's what I didn't say, um, <coughs> is really sigma to the minus 2 of the conformal metric, because <coughs> um, if you explain this more carefully, you see that, that this really induces the conformal metric up here because it, because it has a homogeneity. And so, <coughs> so, the, um, so this induces a conformal metric, and this sigma tilde descends to a density of weight 1 down on the, on the sphere. So, so this, this gives us um, <coughs> a density of weight 1. And the zero locus of that is exactly this boundary at infinity. And it's easy to show really directly from this construction, or put this in the, in the, in the printed notes, um, that, that this really descends to exactly that, uh, in that form. And so the, the zero locus of this density is the boundary. So this becomes the boundary at infinity. <coughs> the other thing I wanted to say um, <coughs> that, I, that I forgot to mention in the last talk is you know, when we get to this point where we mention the Cartan uh, bundle, I wanted to just reflect on why it's a good idea to think of uh, Riemannian geometry, <coughs> or pseudo-Riemannian geometry, <coughs> in, instead as being this reduction of conformal geometry <coughs> with the scale tractor. Okay, so 
<coughs> well, let's, let's look at it at the level of principal bundles. So when you're doing Riemannian geometry, you're basically reducing the bundle of frames to the bundle of um, orthonormal frames, okay? so or proper orthonormal frames. So you get a bundle with, with fiber SON. <coughs> And this is really a story about the tangent bundle to the manifold. So, so, so what, <coughs> what the Riemannian structure tells us is that the, the tangent space um, at each point is, is reduced to uh, having the geometry of Euclidean space or pseudo-Euclidean space um, if you're in another signature. <coughs> but it's really, um, and, and that's, that depends, that's point dependent. So, so what you get immediately in Riemannian geometry is just that information. But <coughs> the... The point is that the tractor bundle, or the equivalent Cartan bundle, so this you should think of as the adapted frame bundle for the, for the tractor bundle, has this, has this tractor connection or Cartan connection. And, it, and if you remember that the formula for the tractor connection, it involves the Scouten tensor and so on. So it, it, it has um, higher order Taylor information about your underlying conformal structure built into the connection. Okay, so. So the point is that, this, the, that the Cartan bundle is, is, has higher order contact with your underlying geometry. So it, it knows more about it, <laughs> it has more derivatives built into the fibers of this thing. So, <clears throat> so when you look at your Riemannian geometry as instead a symmetry reduction of a conformal geometry, and, and by that I mean that you take into account this, this tractor bundle or this Cartan bundle, then you're <coughs> recording um, at every point in the manifold, this, this higher order Taylor information. So, Taylor series information. So, so it's kind of hanging onto your manifold more uh, with, with higher order contact. And that's why you expect to get uh, interesting things. So I'll, I'll uh, yeah, in the second lecture today especially, I'll, um, the second lecture this afternoon, I'll uh, especially come back to this point. You'll see a sort of natural thing that turns up uh, which shows this point of view very well. Okay, um, <clears throat> so let's get back to this afternoon's lecture. Okay, so what we want to talk about now is the geometry <coughs> of conformal infinity. <clears throat> or at least to make the first steps um, using this machinery to understand uh, how to analyze the geometry at, at conformal infinity. There's a lot more one could say. Um, <clears throat> but so we'll start off with um, M plus G plus being conformally compact. <clears throat> and as I say, I usually draw a picture like this, which is perhaps not, not so appropriate uh, when you're in, in some sort of signature, but <coughs> let's just think of it that way anyway. <coughs> and what we want to understand is the, ge so we remember we get an induced conformal structure here, <coughs> um, induced from this uh, conformally compact metric, and we want to understand the, the re relationship between this conformal structure and um, that pseudo-Riemannian structure. <clears throat> okay, well, we <clears throat> want to think of this in our sort of view as um, a conformal manifold <clears throat> equipped with this scale tractor. So I is 1 over D, <clears throat> DA of sigma. <clears throat> and um, sigma is going to be a defining density for the boundary. So, so the boundary is going to be the zero lo locus of sigma. Okay, now what we want to do is look at the consequences of um, different conditions. So, so, <clears throat> so first of all, um, so the first thing is if it's asymptotically, <clears throat> that the scalar curvature of this bulk metric um, goes to a constant, not equals to zero. And I'll be more specific about how I want it to go to a constant. Um, but then, so that's the first thing we'll look at. And then uh, secondly, uh, what happens 
if this, uh, if we have that, that G plus um, becomes uh, Einstein asymptotically uh, with scalar curvature again not zero. Okay, so this is this is more getting more restrictive. So we're asking um, sort of more 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 restrictive condition. We're asking that it's Einstein. Um, <coughs> and what what we want to observe actually is that <coughs> as we move in this direction, um, we we get higher order contact between the the conformal structure here and the the ambient uh, pseudo Riemannian structure, and indeed even higher order contact of of the conformal structures of the two things, <coughs> where I'll explain what I mean by higher order contact as well. Okay, so, <coughs> so let's recall some things we've been talking about. So we have that <coughs> I squared is equal to the scalar curvature of G plus, so minus that over some number d, d minus 1, where d is our dimension of the bulk, um, <coughs> so this is on m, m plus, <coughs> okay, so where sigma is not 0, this, um, the length of this scale tractor just measures minus the scalar curvature roughly. <coughs> so uh, if, we, if we dilate the metric uh, suitably, we may as well look at the conditions <coughs> uh, So this is this is sort of for, for part one of the program here, that um, that i squared goes to plus or minus one uh, at infinity, so at sigma. <coughs> In fact, okay. So now, more specifically, what I want to assume is that. Um, so more precisely, <coughs> I'm going to assume that i squared is equal to plus or minus 1 plus sigma squared f, where f is some smooth uh, weighted function. So, so, well, it's just some sort of section of an appropriately weighted density bundle. I guess uh, uh, minus 2. But, but smooth. Okay, so... So that's how I'm going to assume that this thing, the scalar curvature becomes asymptotically constant by assuming that. So this would be the same as saying the scalar curvature has that sort of behavior um, up to this d, d minus 1 factor. <coughs> okay, so making that assumption, we have this proposition. <coughs> So here, here um, so this is, yeah, this is a scale for the thing. So we have, uh, Okay, so, so what's this saying? Well, remember we just talked about submanifolds, and um, for a submanifold, <coughs> we had this notion of a normal tractor, which you can think of almost like a normal vector, <coughs> and it was, it was given by, in, in terms of some background metric, zero, n, a, and minus the mean curvature, measured in that, <coughs> um, measured in that background uh, metric. So... So what this is saying is that if the scalar curvature becomes constant, suitably fast, then, um, then actually the restriction of the scale tractor to, to its zero locus, to the zero locus of its top slot, to sigma, um, is going to give the, the normal tractor. <coughs> okay, this doesn't require that it's a boundary. It would work along a submanifold, but anyway, we'll think of it as a boundary if you like. Okay, so let's look at how we prove that. Um, so let's, for simplicity, <coughs> let's first assume 
that um, we just have i squared equals plus or minus 1. Okay, so, so this is to say that um, if we were to make that assumption, then actually we would be saying that the, the scalar curvature was just constant on the bulk, on the interior, in the scale. <coughs> okay, so, so uh, G, G plus, as always, is given by sigma to the minus 2 the conformal metric. Okay, so that's what's linking these things together. <coughs> okay, so, so this scale tractor, remember, is 1 over d times the Thomas d operator acting on sigma. So this is, um, and calculated in some background metric, so calculated in terms of some other metric, this is given by sigma, the derivative, the levy sevita derivative of sigma, and then minus the Laplacian of sigma plus j sigma over d. <coughs> so, um, therefore, along sigma, the, the, along the zero locus, <coughs> the boundary, if you like, here, um, we have uh, Ia is equal to zero in a and um, minus one on d. Laplacian sigma. Okay, if it's along the zero locus, this term's going to drop out. Um, and we're taking um, Na to be grad A sigma. <coughs> okay, well, is that a good idea? Well, <coughs> um, yeah, it's not bad. So, so one thing is, um, <coughs> recall that I, I said when we were dealing with submanifolds, that you wanted to take your co-normal to have weight one, right? So this has this is a weight one object, <coughs> um, and uh, it, and and it's sort of co-normal like, right? It's the derivative of this density, which is a defining density. So, um, <coughs> so um, <coughs> because we're asking that that i squared. Well, let's just write it down now. So, um, so i squared equals plus or minus 1 implies that um, G A B N A M B equals plus or minus 1. Because remember when you write out what the expression for this is it involves um, so <coughs> it, it involves uh, G A B grad A sigma <coughs> grad B sigma uh, minus uh, what is it 2 over D or something Sigma Laplacian sigma plus J sigma. <coughs> okay, so along the zero locus, this term drops out, and that's the two the two ends. So, so in fact, this does give us a a, a, a weight one conormal in a nice way. <coughs> All right. So now, <coughs> what we want to do is calculate. Um, so, we, if we compare this. With this, we just need, you can see we just need this thing in the bottom here to end up being um, the mean curvature. <coughs> okay, so let's check that. So remember I gave you an expression for uh, the second fundamental form. Well, if you trace that, you get that d minus 1 h uh, is equal to grad a n a minus or plus uh, N A M B grad B N A. Okay, so this is a formula um, for the mean curvature <coughs> um, given by any any conormal, which is um, a unit conormal along the sub, uh, a hypersurface. So it doesn't matter how N is extended off. <coughs> and that's, that's just by tracing that formula I gave you for the second fundamental form before. <coughs> okay, so let's, let's calculate the terms in this. <coughs> so what we want to do is calculate in terms of sigma. <coughs> okay, well we have one thing is we have Na is, is grad A of sigma. Uh, so this implies that grad A, Na uh, is just going to be the Laplacian of sigma. 
<coughs> so that's good. Since down here we want to get the Laplacian of sigma. Um, <coughs> so let's think, call that one. <coughs> so for the second term, we want to look at um, this thing here. So we have uh, Na, Mb, grad B, Na. <coughs> okay, so this is the derivative in this n direction of Na and then contracting in Na. So, so <coughs> I can just bring this in and say this is a half of uh, Nb grad B <coughs> uh, Na squared. <coughs> Certainly that's fine. <coughs> okay, so now I, I use this fact up here. So I have um, plus or minus 1 <coughs> is equal to, to that stuff there. Um, and so, <coughs> remember this is Na. So plus or minus 1 is um, in, <coughs> uh, Na, Na minus 2 over D sigma Laplacian D plus J sigma. <coughs> so I, I substitute that in here. So I'm going to get... Um, <coughs> Na, uh, Na equals plus or minus 1 <coughs> uh, plus the stuff, I guess. So plus 2 over D sigma delta sigma plus J sigma squared <coughs> with the 2 over D. Yeah. Okay, so let's put all that in there. Um, so this is <coughs> a half in B grad B, <coughs> so I get plus or minus 1, plus 2 over D, sigma Laplacian D, plus 2 over D, J sigma squared. <coughs> okay, but we only want to calculate this along sigma, so, so which is the zero locus of little sigma, and so um, some of these terms are not going to contribute. Well, uh, for a start, <coughs> this is just going to kill the plus or minus 1, but also here, this is a first order derivative. It can hit one of these sigma squared, but, but you'll be left with a sigma which vanishes. So, so this term's not going to contribute, and this one's going to be killed. And the only thing that happens is that <coughs> um, this grad B is going to hit this sigma and give us an NB, um, <coughs> and then N contracted with N is plus or minus 1 again, right? So. So this is going to give us um, <coughs> uh, what's this going to, the two is going to cancel with the two, so we're going to get a one over d um, <coughs> plus or minus uh, Laplacian sigma. Do that right? I think I did. What's that? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Look better, won't it? <coughs> Thanks. Good. Okay, so, so that's now two. <coughs> and we want to, we just take, um, <coughs> where was my formula? Oh, it's up here. So we take this minus or plus this thing we just calculated. Um, so I guess we're always going to get a minus sign, right? So because uh, <coughs> minus plus times plus minus. So, so. So 1 plus 2 implies that uh, d minus 1 h is equal to 1 over d times d minus 1 of Laplacian sigma. So h is equal to 1 over d Laplacian of sigma. <coughs> okay, and now we're done because we wanted to see that this was just minus h. Oh, sorry. You, uh, <laughs> what? That's right. The D, the D minus one's cancelled out. No, that's exactly right. Yeah. <coughs> okay, but now uh, that was if um, I squared was equal to plus or minus one. <coughs> but if I add on here that this is sigma squared F, you can see that this just makes no difference to the calculation because it's enough sigma so that it doesn't enter. That's it. <coughs> Okay. Uh, 
What's that? Be because so we differentiated it once, and then that would pick up the f. Be because because when I um, I differentiate, uh, didn't I differentiate? Yeah. 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 That's right. So sorry. Here. Yeah, so, so here we involve differentiating the term. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, so. Okay, so, good. So what we have is that. <coughs> okay, so now, so now we have that um, I <coughs> um, goes to this normal tractor at the boundary. And so, <coughs> remember... The, the, the perp, so recall that in perp, it, sitting in the ambient tractor bundle along sigma, can be identified with, um, with the intrinsic tractor bundle. So this, this condition of assuming that I squared goes to a constant um, or to a non-zero constant that fast implies that uh, the, the, the tractor bundle of the zero locus is going to agree with, with in the sense with the restriction of the ambient tractor bundle, <coughs> which, is, which is already one level of, of sort of contact um, for the, for the uh, a sort of first level of higher contact for the um, conformal geometry of the boundary. <coughs> okay. <coughs> So yeah, no. So this is so this is I would say a first level of uh, compatibility between um, the conformal structures. So M C and <coughs> Sigma C. Well. A first level of compatibility beyond saying that this is the restriction of that conformal structure. A sort of first, a first next level, <laughs> something like that. Okay, let me put this up. Okay, so um, let me write something down first. So <coughs> if, if I squared along sigma <coughs> um, is equal to plus or minus 1, <coughs> and so let's say that it's 1, and uh, 2, we have that <coughs> grad A, I, B um, is equal to sigma, FAB for some suitable smooth uh, object there. <coughs> Oops. <coughs> so we want that to just have weight minus one, so it's a tense attractor object. Um, then <coughs> sigma is totally umbilic. <coughs> okay, so, <coughs> so, so why does this happen? Well, um, 
<coughs> again, we're going to just use our results from the last lecture. So, so here, um, for a start, I'm asking that this thing become parallel at a certain rate, right? So at the boundary, this will be zero. So, um, so proof. So this is now, <coughs> this is now a notion where um, we're asking the, the scalar curvature to become constant at the boundary, but we're also <coughs> to become a non-zero constant at the boundary, but we're asking that the, the, um, the metric G plus <coughs> becomes Einstein um, at the boundary, <coughs> okay, in, in, at, at, at this rate. So we're asking this parallel tractor, this tractor to become parallel, the scale tractor. <coughs> Okay, well, these assumptions one and two <coughs> um, easily imply the assumptions we had over there that um, I squared is uh, plus or minus one plus sigma squared F <coughs> for some smooth F. Okay, so, so, <coughs> so we have the results we had before. Um, so we have that I along sigma is equal to the normal tractor. <coughs> Therefore, what 2 implies is that we have that grad A um, of the normal tractor is, is going to be, well, so, so <coughs> I agrees with the normal tractor at the boundary, but we're also asking that I is parallel um, <coughs> in the direction of the boundary along the boundary. So, <coughs> so, the, so the, um, the, the normal tractor is going to be parallel along the boundary. Therefore, um, so the proposition from the previous lecture <coughs> implies that um, the, the mount, that sigma is totally umbilic. <coughs> so we see that if we... Um, Ask for this asymptotic Einstein condition um, at, at this rate, then, um, <coughs> then we're getting uh, total umbilicity. Oh yeah, so I just wanted to make a little comment about this. Um, so <coughs> one nice way to think about what totally umbilic means um, is it means that it's conformally totally geodesic, um, by which I mean, so So what I mean is that if, if a metric, if a, if a submanifold is totally umbilic, then um, there's a metric in a neighborhood, at least locally, um, of the submanifold that actually makes uh, it totally geodesic. And the way to see this is that, um, recall that <coughs> this thing, um, this... Uh, <coughs> the mean curvature transforms in the following way, we, we explained in the last lecture, th this is um, the old uh, mean curvature plus the normal uh, contracted into epsilon. So here if, if g hat um, <coughs> is, uh, well, equal to, um, 
e to the 2 omega times uh, g, then <coughs> this epsilon is, is d omega. All right, so um, in particular, if you take omega to be defined to be equal to minus sigma times the, uh, the mean curvature that you have already, then you can see that, <coughs> um, well, I guess it'll be uh, plus or minus or plus that, <laughs> depending on your, uh, with your n squares to plus or minus 1. <coughs> then, um, then what will happen here is that you get Hg plus uh, uh, Na uh, grad A on um, sigma Hg, <coughs> and this will be Hg plus, and then, then this is just going to be N A N A H plus sigma times something, <coughs> um, sorry, uh, minus or plus. <coughs> and so depending on whether this is plus or minus, these will cancel out. <coughs> okay, so you can, you can rescale to make the mean curvature go away, and therefore... Um, if L0 was 0 and now you've arranged that HG equals 0, you get that the <coughs> second fundamental form vanishes. So, so t totally umbilic implies it is conformally totally geodesic. <coughs> okay, so what we have now is that if the, um, if the manifold is, is conformally, iron, uh, is asymptotically Einstein in this sense, <coughs> and provided it has the scalar curvature being non-zero, then, um, then the, the, the boundary has to be conformally totally geodesic in this sense. So, so we're getting um, even more contact, a uh, higher order contact between the, uh, the boundary, the conformal structure of the boundary, compatibility between that and the interior conformal geometry, if you like. <coughs> now, if we assume just a little bit more if we assume that it becomes uh, asymptotically Einstein just a little bit faster, then we can do a bit better than that. <coughs> so, so, uh, okay, so, yeah. Let's say with better, <laughs> for <coughs> with it becoming uh, Einstein more rapidly, we get more. <coughs> okay, so first of little observation. <coughs> the, um, so suppose <coughs> that we have um, I squared along sigma is plus or minus 1. Just constant, but non-zero is what we want. <coughs> and uh, grad A of IB <coughs> is equal to, well, over there I had sigma, but I want to ha now have sigma squared times something. Some other AB. So this would have weight minus 2 now, but it doesn't matter. So this is some smooth thing. So suppose that this is becoming 0 at that rate, <coughs> then the claim is that the vial curvature has to kill the normal direction <coughs> uh, along the boundary. <coughs> okay, well the, pr the proof of this is very easy, so... So what we have is that I is parallel along the boundary, at least to the given order. Um, <coughs> so what, what we certainly have along the boundary is that the tractor curvature <coughs> is going to have to kill, um, kill, the, kill the scale tractor because, it's, it, because basically it's parallel. It's parallel enough, right? So this is along sigma. 
<coughs> but we already know from what we've just been saying before that this implies this becomes the normal tractor. So you have K A B C D N D is zero along sigma. And now you just remember what the what this looks like. So we have zero 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 uh, cotton <coughs> vial minus cotton zero 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 going into zero n a minus h. <coughs> so this is zero, and the only thing that's being picked up there is when the when the vial contracts into the normal. Okay, well, um, as a little uh, corollary of that, um, a sort of obvious corollary that, the, that you can't have this, so uh, So the, the, a, a generic vial curvature uh, obstructs these asymptotics. So in other words, if the vial curvature had sort of maximal rank um, everywhere, then you couldn't have these asymptotics. So you need, this is just a necessary condition. So I'm just pointing out that's a kind of obvious conformal obstruction to, to having um, this thing conformally compact and asymptotically Einstein in this way. <coughs> okay, so... <coughs> Really, the last thing I wanted to say in this bit <coughs> so if you have I squared is plus or minus one along the boundary. <coughs> And grad A, so this thing becomes Einstein at this rate. <coughs> then um, the ambient tractor connection <coughs> of uh, <coughs> MC. So the, of our bulk manifold preserves <coughs> the tractor bundle of the conformal infinity <coughs> and its restriction <coughs> gives the intrinsic tractor connection for the conformal infinity. So so the claim is now we have enough in place so that if, 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 if the thing is asymptotically Einstein at that rate, provided the scalar curvature is becoming something non-zero at the boundary, then the, the, the actual boundary tractor connection has to agree completely with the ambient one in that sense. <coughs> so that's quite high order contact. So... <coughs> Well, we basically have everything in place for this now because the proof is <coughs> this intrinsic tractor bundle, so from the last lecture, <coughs> is the same um, as the, 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 can be identified with the perp of the normal tractor. <coughs> and then from what we were just saying over there, this is the <coughs> uh, perp of this um, scale tractor along the boundary. 
And so since I is parallel, <coughs> then that's implying that N is parallel, and so um, and so so the ambient connection is going to preserve the, the tractor bundle. So so um, In other words, that um, shape form tractor that we wrote down in the last lecture is going to be zero. <coughs> okay. So, so this, um, so this perped um, <coughs> tractor connection, which was the projected ambient tractor connection, is just um, the the sort of uh, ambient tractor connection in in the uh, <coughs> in the tangential direction. So. We could write it like that. <laughs> okay, now remember this thing differs from the um, intrinsic uh, tractor connection by this Fialkov tensor. So, <clears throat> so remember we had this the difference between this and this one was this uh, SABC thing, and, and the only real content of that was this Fialkov tensor, <coughs> uh, FAB. And so how did that look? Well, it looked like this, 1 over D minus 3, <coughs> vial ABCD, uh, NC, ND, plus L0 AB, L0 squared AB, <coughs> minus L0, over D minus 2 <coughs> GAB, something like that. Okay, but <coughs> we've already explained that um, <coughs> the, the thing has to be totally umbilic because, because this is zero, this shape form tractor, so, so the, the boundary is totally umbilic, so these trace three second fundamental form things go, and on the other hand, um, we just explained over there that the normal derivative into the vial is zero, so that term goes as well. <coughs> okay, um, so this so this is a sort of um, very direct way of showing that um, when when things are asymptotically Einstein in a suitable way, that the, the tractor bundles have to actually line up. Um, <coughs> this is also done from a completely different point of view in the, in the Duke article where we do this um, holonomy reduction business. So, so there, um, <coughs> there you, you, um, you look at these different Cartan geometries and so on that you get on these, on these different curved orbit types and <coughs> um, there's a normalization condition for the Cartan connection. So from a Cartan connection you can calculate its curvature and then <coughs> um, the, 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 you get the normal Cartan connection if this curvature satisfies an algebraic condition. It's, it's del star closed, where that's a Lie algebra cohomology operator. But anyway, um, suffice to say, you can use rather general arguments for this case to show that, that um, in that case, on, on this, uh, along this closed orbit, you, you can show that the, the induced uh, connect, Cartan connection that you get um, is normal and therefore you're getting, um, the, you're getting the same result, that you get the, the um, standard tractor connection induced on the boundary from this orbit decomposition. So, so if you look in there, there's a completely different proof of the same result. What's that? Yeah, well, you need it to be completely parallel, but you can, <laughs> you, the, with this asymptotics, you can conclude it from there. But yeah, no, the result in there would certainly assume it's a holonomy reduction. So, so the result in there assumes that it is completely parallel. But what I mean is if you, you know, 
you add a few neurons to, to, to that, you can, you can, you can deduce that, that the same result holds. Yeah. Okay, so that was what I wanted to say about this. Um, it's probably a right point to pause, even though I'm a bit early, uh, because I, the other thing's going to start on a different tack. And it's also, I think we'll finish early anyway. All right, so um, <coughs> we want to talk in a, in a minute about uh, kind of uh, boundary calculus. But just, just before I do that, there was something else I wanted to mention, um, which... <coughs> which is um, why you get a tractor connection on the model, um, another description of that. So I told you in the case, um, you know, for conformal geometry, we, we draw this picture with the cone and all that. We say, well, Rn plus 2 has its affine connection, blah, 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 therefore you get it. There's an even easier way, in fact, to see that, um, why you get it on the model. Um, you don't, you don't get all the structure that we got with that, but, but you get to see the connection. So, um, so, so you, you want to work on some G mod P, right? It's some homogeneous space. That's your model. <coughs> it doesn't matter whether it's parabolic or not, right? So this is a, a closed Lie subgroup and G is a Lie group. <coughs> and, and, and this is your, um, your favorite structure and you want to do some, some calculus on there or something like that. So, so there's a, there's a uh, canonical tractor connection on such a thing, right? So it's because you have, <coughs> you have this principal bundle, which is G over G mod P. And so, <coughs> so you, get an, you get associated bundles. <coughs> for every P representation. For V a P representation. <coughs> okay, so for instance, um, so, so you can form uh, G cross P V, right? So, <coughs> um, <coughs> so for every P representation you get, you get such an associated bundle, and, and one you might like to get um, is the tangent bundle, for instance. So the tangent bundle to a homogeneous space like that is, uh, arises in this way. So this is G cross uh, P, and the representation here is the Lie algebra of G quotient the Lie algebra of, of P. Okay, and it's an easy exercise um, that, that would probably be instructive for you to do if you haven't done it, to show that the tangent bundle to this arises as an associated bundle in that way. Um, <coughs> so, so, you know, associated bundle, all the natural bundles, all the, all the tensor bundles and so on are associated bundles in that way. So, um, <coughs> but, you, but, but you don't get a, a, a canonical linear connection on such, uh, on, on the tangent bundle, generally, right? <coughs> so, if, yeah, so you, you, you may sometimes, but not generally. So, <coughs> um, what, what you do always get is a tractor connection. So if um, V is actually <coughs> a G representation, okay, so instead of just a P representation, but a G representation, then you get a, <coughs> then you get a linear connection. And, and, and in this case, we call this a tractor bundle. Well, I mean, it's kind of silly. This is <laughs> this is just flat stuff. It's on hope. No, you know, no one would have used that term if it didn't if these didn't generalize to the curve case. But these are the the flat cases of tractor bundles. And the way you get this connection is that <coughs> so so here's the proof. <coughs> um, so so G cross P V. Is, is just G cross V mod this equivalence relation. And remember I said the equivalence relation was that uh, GP, you multiply the right by P in, in the subgroup, and you have V in here, <coughs> then this is similar to GPV. Okay, so that's, that's the equivalence relation. But actually, 
If this is a G representation, then you can canonically trivialize that. You can canonically trivialize that. So, so, <coughs> okay, and you do that by just mapping um, GV to GPV, uh, GPGV. <laughs> right now, this is well defined because um, <coughs> because if you do this, <laughs> if you send this that to that, or you send that to that, it's easy to see that you get the same thing. So, <coughs> so this is well defined. So this so this descends, you know. So this gives you a map, a well defined map from here to here. <coughs> okay, but what that means is that. If you so this is now um, this is now a, a trivial bundle. So you just take so 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 sections here correspond to just v-valued functions on here, but on v-valued functions you just have the exterior derivative. So so the so the exterior derivative on these v-valued functions pulls back to a connection over here under this canonical trivialization. <coughs> And it's really that simple in the, in the flat case. So, and it's, it's easy to check and instructive actually to, 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 to check that I'm being honest here and that the way I described the connection before is the same as this, but, but it is if you think through it. So, so that um, trivial connection that you get on Rn plus 2 corresponds exactly to doing this trivialization like that. Okay, but, but this now, as I say, this is just completely general. Um, <clears throat> because it, it, this is just a group, this is P is a Lee subgroup, then you get such a tracked connection if you just take representations of the, um, <coughs> of the, of, of the, of G. And in fact, <coughs> if you think, you think, okay, what properties do I want of the mora cartan connection so that this would continue to work if I curved it? So in other words, if I take a principal bundle so you could reinvent the Cartan connection as follows. So you say, I'm going to have a principal bundle <coughs> over M um, <coughs> with the same fiber, and I'm going to equip it with a thing that looks a bit like the mora Cartan form, but I'm going to ask weaker equivariance properties. And you say, what weaker equivariance properties do I need? So I want just enough left so that this works, and you come up with the usual definition of the Cartan connection. It really hits it on the nose, so it's exactly what you need to get linear connections. <coughs> and then the only, the only thing is you need slightly less, so you only need V really to be a GP representation. <coughs> right? So for, for a Cartan connection, you don't need it to be actually a representation of G restricted to P. It has to be a representation of the Lie algebra of G um, and a representation of P in a way that's compatible. And then that's exactly what, in a sense, you, you can recover the definition of, of a Cartan connection. Okay, um, let's get back to work. I just did want to mention that because it takes part of the mystery out of tractor bundles. <coughs> Okay, so we, we looked at this thing here and we looked at a range of conditions um, that link the geometry of the boundary of the conformal infinity to the geometry of the interior in a sense. So this is uh, in terms of order of contact and so on. So, so we ended up, if this thing is asymptotically Einstein in a suitable way, then the um, <coughs> tractor connection for the boundary is compatible with the tractor connection of the interior. And that becomes very useful for problems um, if you want to do um, boundary problems and so on. So um, <coughs> I'll, I won't get to go fully into why that's useful for boundary problems, but let me start talking about the sort of boundary problems I mean. OK, so <coughs> okay, but we keep a picture like this in mind. And by the way, Someone asked me again, I did say before, that although I'm drawing this picture that makes it look like this com is compact, everything's really just local around the boundary. And I don't care you know, if, if the boundary, the, the whole thing may look like this and the boundary may have two components or there may be a black hole or something in a boundary out here. But we're really just working near the boundary at the moment, um, 
looking at what happens there. <coughs> okay, so let's um, let's start with a uh, conformal manifold. <coughs> I'm still in the process of changing notation compared to my notes, so things you know, if things get wacky, just tell me. So, okay, so a conformal manifold, and I'm going to equip it with a scale tractor. <coughs> let's suppose. Um, this is one of these almost pseudo-Ramanian things or something. So in other words, this scale tractor doesn't vanish. Um, now the conformal part of this story <coughs> implies that we have this Thomas D operator, right? So, so <coughs> remember we have DA. <coughs> the second order operator. So this is a thing that takes, for instance, a density <coughs> um, of weight W and uh, gives us, um, <coughs> let's re remember the formula for it, n plus 2w minus 2. So this is in here, <coughs> section thereof, right? So times w times f, <coughs> that same number again. Actually, d is my dimension now, isn't it? Thanks. <coughs> plus 2w minus 2, grad a f, um, and then minus Laplacian plus w, uh, trace of Scouten times F. <coughs> okay, so that's that's DA of F. <coughs> so that's that's something conformal geometry gives us. Nothing to do with um, picking this uh, scale tractor. Um, and also, by the way, um, <coughs> I've said that F is a density of that weight, but remember that it could also have tractor indices of any type which I'm suppressing, but it, so it could have any sort of tractor indices and that formula still works. <coughs> okay, well then it's natural to form this, so <coughs> okay, so um, <coughs> so so this is just the scale tractor contracted into this um, this, this thing. I mean, why not? This thing, this thing I've written with an index up, this I've written with an index down, why not contract them? Actually, you know, that, that's not a joke. The, <coughs> the Laplacian is, is, is natural for a very similar reason. You know, you have a metric around, <coughs> and so you have an inverse metric, you have the levy sevita connection, you form the most obvious thing, so the most obvious scalar operator. But if you have this um, Cartan-type geometry, associated with conformal geometry, so you have this um, tractor bundle and so on, then, <coughs> then doing this sort of move is of the same, it's just as natural as forming the Laplacian. Okay, so, so if you think of your, um, <coughs> your pseudo-Romanian manifold as, as having something to do with conformal geometry secretly, then looking at things like this are a good idea, e even if it's not conformally compact. But let, let's suppose here that it is going to be conformally compact. So, <clears throat> okay. Now, before I want to, I want to study this a little bit, see what it is. Um, just as a as a step towards doing that, <clears throat> I want to um, think of. I want to define the weight operator. So I'll write um, W underline. So for the weight operator. <clears throat> so this is the, conf the conformal weight operator, so it's only going to act on things that have a weight. Um, so <clears throat> on, on tractors that have some weight W. Okay, so, <clears throat> so what I mean is that uh, for, for F in here, then if we apply this weight operator to F, we get W times F. <laughs> Okay, so not doing much. Um, <clears throat> but, but one thing to notice is that the weight operator, in a sense, behaves like a first order operator. So, um, so if you have uh, F in um, things of weight 1, <coughs> so in section in here, of course, but it doesn't matter. So um, <coughs> if you have something in here <coughs> and something, uh, so F1 in here, F2 in 
<coughs> in here, then the weight operator on F1 times F2 <coughs> is, of course, W on F1 times F2 plus F1, W on F2, which is W1 plus W2, F2, F1, F2. <coughs> so it's a kind of, uh, in that sense, if you act on weighted things, it's going to behave like a first order operator. All right, there's a reason for that. You can even represent it um, on a sort of cone over the manifold as a first order operator, so it does want to behave that way. And then, and then weighted functions correspond to homogeneous things. All right, <coughs> anyway, so, so doing that, I want to look at what I dot D is. So, <coughs> so well, I is um, minus one on D Laplacian sigma plus J sigma. <coughs> so I guess we're going to imagine as usual that we have some metric G plus which is sigma to the minus 2 of a conformal metric. So that's what the sigma is here. And I is 1 over D, DA sigma. <coughs> OK, so, and then we have grad A, sigma, sigma. So that's the, the I bit. And this is multiplying into that, that thing. But now I want to think of this as being a weight operator. So D plus 2W minus 2. <coughs> and I'm just writing those on the right because, um, <coughs> because if I write that on the left of this J, for instance, it'll see that weight, but I want to see the weight it's acting on. <coughs> okay, so now you expand this out, <coughs> and what you find, you preferably don't use quite such big writing. Uh, but anyway, <coughs> so you get that I dot D written in terms of some scale G <coughs> is equal to sigma Laplacian plus uh, D plus 2W. Now, I'm <laughs> even though I wrote it all in the weight operator, I want you to think of it that way, but let's just write it acting on uh, something that has weight W. <coughs> not W or W not, W will do. <coughs> so... Uh, right. No, minus. Okay, so you can check that at some stage. So you expand it out and it looks like that. <coughs> um, therefore, okay, so what happens? So um, <coughs> let's look at about at this end scale. <coughs> so so we, if we work in the metric G+, plus, then um, remember that we will get that... <coughs> Uh, the, the, the levy sevita connection of that will kill sigma. Okay, so some terms will drop out, um, like this term here, that term there, <coughs> um, and what we'll get um, is that I dot D equals, <coughs> now, um, I'm missing a minus, that was a minus. <coughs> And that one there times that one there, right? So this, remember, I've used the metric to kind of uh, move this over so that so the, it becomes top, swap top and bottom because of the, the way the metric looks. Um, so <coughs> this becomes minus uh, Laplacian for G plus, plus 2W D plus W minus 1 over D J G plus. <coughs> okay, so... Um, now, what I've done here also is um, I've trivialized the density bundles. <coughs> so, basically, this amounts to sort of setting sigma equals to 1. I mean, I'm not really setting sigma equals to 1, but I'm using... Um, <coughs> I'm, 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 
uh, trivialize, using sigma to trivialize the density bundles and then, and then taking sigma out of the expression. But <coughs> um, anyway, so the simple way of thinking of that is sort of sigma becomes 1. And then <coughs> you get that formula from this. So, so uh, it's just this term. So, so the sigma you think of as 1, there's that Laplacian, and here's this other term there. <coughs> okay, so, okay, now suppose um, a sort of standard setting people work in. <coughs> uh, so, so, we're, so this is, for instance, on the bulk of our, our, um, <coughs> our, our conformally compact manifold. We're working with this thing on the bulk um, at that point. And suppose that we arrange that on the bulk that the scalar curvature is constant. So suppose <coughs> we arrange that the trace of Scouten, which is just the multiple of the scalar curvature, is equal to uh, minus or plus d on 2. <coughs> In fact, that's, that's what people usually do work with. <coughs> so this is equivalent to um, the scalar curvature of g plus being minus or plus d, d minus 1. <coughs> um, and it's equivalent to i squared being equal to plus or minus 1. <laughs> Right, so all of those things are, are the same statement where sigma is not zero. Um, <coughs> and this I is nicely normalized. So um, if, if the structure is conformally flat and you have that scale, then this is plus or minus one sectional curvature. So that, that's how it's normalized. <coughs> so that's why it is what people usually work with. Okay, but then we've, we've, we've got that this is... Um, minus or plus d on 2, so that d on 2 is going to go. And so what you get is that i dot d is equal in g plus to minus Laplacian g plus or minus uh, s n minus s, <coughs> where um, I've made a change, s is equal to n plus w. Okay, well, it, why I've written it this way is this is exactly um, the sort of, um, so then sometimes called the spectral parameter. <coughs> this is exactly, um, so the, 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 this eigen problem for this operator is exactly one that's looked at in, in scattering theory a lot. So, <coughs> um, so, for instance, you know, if you look in the Graham's Borsky thing, Um, it's exactly this in that case, um, <coughs> let me see, with, with this being negative, so, so that would that, be a plus s, n minus s. Um, the sign of the Laplacian might be different and so on, so you have to be careful in comparing it in that sense. But, but basically, this is the, the usual spectral eigen problem that, that um, it, when you put that equal to zero, that is looked at <coughs> um, in, in relation to scattering, as for instance, uh, they do, or, you know, Melrose and... Um, um, at Sayo and people have looked at. So, so this, now that there, <coughs> they come up with this eigen problem by looking at the initial equation. So this S, N minus S are, are roots of an initial equation. But the point is, um, <coughs> which I don't want to go into here, but the point is that the, these are coming out for free from conformal geometry by just coupling with the scale tractor. So, um, <coughs> so now the interesting thing is that the, this is on the bulk, right, where, where the scale's not zero, it becomes this. But this operator goes to the boundary, right? So, <coughs> so the, the right-hand side isn't defined on the boundary. That's the plus metric, because th this metric doesn't go to the boundary. But the operator on the left-hand side does go to the boundary. So what does it become there? So, um <coughs> okay, so... <coughs> So on the other hand, along sigma, this i dot d degenerates. <coughs> so it's a degenerate Laplacian operator. Um, <coughs> and it degenerates, of course, because this, this sigma times the Laplacian here. And, <coughs> and this sigma becomes zero at the boundary. And this was defined in terms of the uh, conformal metric and so on. So, so this bit is sort of okay, but this is going to kill that term. So what happens at the boundary 
um, is that <coughs> um, if, let's say, I squared was equal to um, plus or minus 1 plus uh, sigma f, right, <coughs> in the context of our last talk, then uh, <coughs> along the boundary, we would have that I, uh, Ia is the normal tractor, <coughs> and so I dot D just becomes uh, the normal tractor dotted into D. <coughs> and now if you look at, if you look at D, <coughs> where have I got it? Here it is. So yeah, so now imagine you've got the normal tractor here, so you're going to have 0 N <coughs> um, minus H dotted into this thing. <coughs> And so what you get is simply that um, this is D plus 2W minus 2 delta N, where uh, delta N is uh, called the conformal Rob Robin op Robin Robin operator. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Say it again. Uh, sorry. Oh, here? Um, let me see. Did I want a sigma squared? Yeah, I did. Right. Sorry. <coughs> Thank you. Um, <coughs> so this is the, the, uh, the conformal uh, Rob, Rob, Robin operator of, of Cherrier. So there's French people everywhere now. <coughs> Scattered everywhere. So this is... Um, so in a scale G... Um, a acting on, on, you know, let's say tractors of weight W. This is given by the, the normal um, contracted uh, into, <coughs> into some background metric that, that's, that you use minus W times the mean curvature. <coughs> okay, so it's, it's, it's a Robin operator because it's, it's a mixture of this derivative and zeroth order term. Um, and but but this this conf the, it's conformally invariant, and this was uh, first constructed, I believe, by Sheria in some Journal of Functional Analysis article <coughs> some some years ago. Okay, so that comes out for free is what that thing comes becomes at the boundary. Um, <coughs> okay, but let's. <coughs> Given, given this especially, um, <coughs> given that this is something that's studied a lot anyway, um, <coughs> let's think of this as, as a good operator. So I said it was natural from the point of view of conformal geometry, using conformal geometry to study these conformally compact things. <coughs> but on top of that, we see that it's, it's recovering something that's studied uh, anyway. <coughs> so, so I want to make a... A boundary calculus for the for the i dot d operator boundary calculus, and we want to use it for the i dot d problem. So you want to you want to look at this problem with some boundary data, you know, boundary conditions. There's then a question of what are good boundary conditions. So <coughs> anyway, okay. So <coughs> so we have <coughs> so remember that from the scale tractor. If you contract, um, you contract the canonical tractor into the scale tractor, you get the top slot of the tractor back, so you get the sigma, which gives the scale. Um, <coughs> so remember that IA here is, um, in some metric, is going to be sigma uh, times what I'll call uh, NA, <coughs> and then rho, whatever that is. So NA is grad A, Sigma and and then the row is um, minus one on D, the plus in sigma plus J sigma. <coughs> but the details won't matter too much to us. Um, <coughs> what we want to do is 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 uh, compare. Um, well, compute for instance the commutator of of I dot D with sigma because sigma. Um, is our defining density for the boundary, right? So, so we can actually um, deal with things uh, 
asymptotically at the boundary in terms of sort of um, expansions in sigma. You know, so you have f plus sigma times something plus sigma squared and so on. So we want to look at problems like that. <coughs> okay, so here's a lemma, <coughs> which I won't prove, but it's not hard to do. It's just a calculation. If you take i dot d <coughs> and you compute the commutator with sigma, <coughs> then what you get is uh, i squared d plus 2 times this weight operator. <coughs> okay, and this, this is why I wanted to think of it as a weight operator. So for, to do calculations like this, um, multiplying by sigma changes the weight and so on. <coughs> so to sort of formulate a nice answer like this, <coughs> you want to um, <coughs> think of the weight, uh, thing as a weight operator. Okay, well this, you know, this is quite surprising. So um, because, you know, there's a bit of a mess in the middle. <laughs> but, but the dust settles, and you really get I squared D plus 2W coming out. Um, so you should be a little bit surprised and, you know, rush away and check it and so on. Um, now, I dot D, so that's the lemma. So I dot D lowers the weight by 1. Okay, so, so remember the D operator lowers the weight, and... and I has no weight. The scale tractor has weight zero. So, so this thing lowers the weight by one. On the other hand, sigma raises weight by one. <coughs> um, and so these things imply that if you take this weight operator and compute the commutator with I dot D, you'll get minus I dot D <coughs> because it lowers the weight by one. Um, and if you compute it with that thing, <coughs> then you'll, you'll get sigma back again. Like I said, it satisfies the Leibniz, and you should so think of it like first order. So if it was first order, this is just the same as this acting on that. Um, and then you get sigma back again. OK. So, <coughs> okay, so well, these three things, so this thing, this thing, and this thing, imply this proposition. Let's set x equal to sigma. I'm just renaming it. So, uh, and now y I'm going to set to be equal to minus 1 over i squared i dot d. So I guess I'm assuming i squared is nowhere zero. I should have said that. I was going to restrict to that at the moment. <coughs> um, and then set h to be d plus 2w. then what you see is that h uh, x is 2x, <coughs> um, h y is uh, minus 2y, <coughs> and x y equals h. Okay, well this was, this was sort of x y, right? But I have to divide by i squared and put a minus sign, um, and then there's the h. It's written the other way around. Okay, so that was the kind of main bit of this. And this is just these two things about, um, because, because this is D plus 2W, but D is just a number, so that just commutes with everything. So it's really just two times the weight operator. Okay, well, I guess you recognize those uh, things. So X, Y, and Z um, are standard <coughs> SL2 generators. What's that? Ah, X. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Just, I know the alphabet, nothing else at this stage. <coughs> um, okay, so, <coughs> so, so, so we've somehow recovered uh, um, an SL2. Uh, so what? Well, we can apply this quite quickly, actually. Um, but it, actually, just before I do that, I should say that... Um, <coughs> If you wanted to do the, the Ricci flat version of this, so um, in other words, if I squared was equal to zero, um, then, then what you get, if you set Y just to be equal to minus I dot D instead of that divided by I squared, then you get um, HX 
<coughs> equals 2x and hy equals minus 2y and xy equals 0. And this is a Wigner contraction <coughs> of, this, um, of this SL2. So I don't know. Uh, yeah, maybe may cute, maybe useful, I don't know. But uh, that's what happens. All right. Now I want to uh, apply this <coughs> to construct what I'll call tangential operators. <clears throat> okay, um, <clears throat> suppose, this is a definition I guess, so suppose um, P is some sort of operator which acts, uh, for instance, on uh, tractor bundles of weight W, of some weight, W1, <coughs> and uh, goes to tractor bundles, um, maybe different ones or maybe the same, but let, let's suppose the same for simplicity, um, of some other weight, W2. <coughs> Actually, it doesn't really matter that they're tractor bundles, but let, let's just think that way. Um, <coughs> And um, suppose this is some linear differential operator. <clears throat> and I want it to be a differential operator um, along sigma or, you know, in a neighborhood of sigma. So you, it, it's even better in a way to think of sigma as being just a hypersurface. And so around the hypersurface you have this, um, you have this linear differential operator. So, but I definitely want it in a neighborhood of sigma, and I want it defined, um, you know, also along sigma. So, <clears throat> okay, so I'll say that <coughs> P is tangential <coughs> if, if this happens, tangential along sigma, if... Um, P of sigma, so this is the defining uh, density for sigma, equals sigma of P tilde for some other operator, for some other uh, differential operator. I don't care so much about that one. <coughs> well, uh, <coughs> okay, so... <clears throat> yeah, so what, so what this, so why do I want to say that's tangential? Well, okay, so that's the definition, that's the end of the definition, but why do I want to make that? Well, <clears throat> um, the point is that um, if I take, if this is tangential in this way, then <clears throat> I do P of F, some section, and I'm interested in this along sigma, okay? So... Um, I'm interested in, in taking P of F and then looking at its value along sigma. But, <clears throat> but if I add to this um, sigma of something else, uh, H is a bad letter, uh, I don't know, let's, and what's another, an another function name? Um, I'll, I'll call it H, but it's not the tractor metric, okay. <laughs> so, so F plus sigma H, and then evaluate it sigma, is going to be the same as uh, P of F evaluated at sigma. All right, because, because when I have the P of sigma, all the weights, you know, this thing has to have the right weight so that the, this works out. So this has, so sigma times H has to end up being in here. So H would have to have weight W1 minus <clears> 1. <throat> Just to emphasize that, so W1 minus 1. <coughs> But then, yeah, so this P, the P of sigma is sigma of something, and sigma is zero along big sigma, so, so these things agree. So, so what this means is that along sigma, P doesn't see how F is extended off. Okay? So as it's a differential operator, that means in real money that you could write it in terms of coordinate derivatives only going in the directions of, of, of sigma, of big sigma. <clears throat> okay. 
<coughs> now, such operators, um, oh, perhaps going up would be good. It turns out that um, in conformal geometry, the use of this um, idea of tangential operators has been has been quite important. So, <coughs> well, the yeah, the results of using them have been important. In particular, this uh, Graham Jean Mason Sparling construction of the uh, of their differential operators, the the um, GJMS operators, their conformally invariant powers of the Laplacian, are constructed using an idea like this in the ambient manifold. <coughs> okay, so. Uh, let's construct some tangential operators using our calculus. So, so theorem, <coughs> let's take PK to be defined to be equal to YK. Um, so this is minus 1 over I squared, <coughs> I dot D, to the power of K. Okay, so, <coughs> so, so we're, you know, we're in the setting where uh, we're on a conformal manifold, <coughs> um, say conformally compact if you like, the, zero, the boundary is the zero locus of sigma, and we have this i, and let, let's say i squared is, um, I don't know, bounded away from zero. But we don't, we're not assuming anything else about it, okay? So, so it just means that the scalar curvature as you go, to, um, go towards this boundary or towards sigma is bounded away from zero, basically. Yes, that's all we're going to assume. <coughs> we get this SL2. Um, <coughs> then this thing, <coughs> acting on densities or tractors of weight K minus N over 2, <coughs> and then it goes to the same bundle but twisted by densities of weight minus K uh, minus N over 2. <coughs> this is tangential. Okay, so what? Well, <coughs> therefore, this determines a canonical operator, differential operator, <coughs> P bar K, <coughs> taking tractors of that weight, K minus N on 2, <coughs> to tractors minus k minus n on 2. <coughs> okay, well, we should prove this, but <coughs> before I prove it, let me emphasize that something's happened here because <coughs> we, we have, um, <coughs> what we have is, is a, let's say, a conformally compact manifold. We're only assuming that the, that the um, bulk structure has the property that the scalar curvature is bounded away from zero as we go to the boundary nothing else. <coughs> the boundary has a conformal structure. <coughs> this, this is telling us that the, the, that the bulk is determining a conformally invariant operator along the boundary that differentiates in tangential directions. Uh -huh. uh, along <laughs> sigma, is that what you mean? Yeah, the, these are the same. So this is along sigma. Um, yeah, so the, these are these bundles restricted to sigma, if you like. So, is that better? Yeah. <coughs> so, getting tired. <laughs> so, yeah, so, for instance, just take the case of densities. You know, so forget about tractors to keep, keep your life simple. This is finding conformal operators on the boundary determined by the bulk. <coughs> Okay, just canonically, and we, we didn't assume much. So, okay, so what's the proof? Let me, because I don't want to bend down. Uh, <coughs> X, Y to the K, so this is a <coughs> Lee bracket, is Y to the K minus 1, K, H minus K plus 1. <coughs> All right. This is just um, this is just 
just SL2 stuff, right? So this is X, uh, Y, H, SL2 implies that. <coughs> so you can, you can just prove this by induction um, easily. A couple of lines. Um, therefore, on uh, F in here, <coughs> K minus N over 2 minus 1, <coughs> um, the minus 1, because I want to multiply by sigma and get something of the right weight, we have uh, y to the k, x, x is 0. <coughs> okay, so, so if I've done the numbers right, um, this, this, this eight, so this weight will be exactly right, so when you put it in with this h and that, it'll cancel out, and this factor will become zero. And that's, <coughs> that's really uh, all there is to it. So, so in other words, so we get y to the k x f equals x y to the k f, and we wanted to prove that y to the k times sigma of something was sigma times, uh, sorry, yeah, y to the sigma on f is sigma times uh, some operator on f, and that proves it. Okay? <coughs> okay. Um, in fact, <coughs> if um, M plus and G plus is Einstein, <coughs> um, Einstein with, with non-zero cosmological constant, I mean, then <coughs> on uh, K minus N on 2, so these densities, these ambient densities restrict to densities on the boundary of the same weight. That all works out. You can show that. Um, these, this operator that one constructs uh, by this theorem is actually the GJMS operator <coughs> um, where these are defined. So, and zero, so this is if k is even, and zero if k is odd. <coughs> okay, so these things actually vanish when k is odd if the thing is Einstein, not generally. Um, and <coughs> when k is even, up to the order that the GJMS operators are, de are defined, so there's some, you know, I could tell you about that, um, you recover those. So, and, so these are the things along the boundary, which are Laplacian, boundary Laplacian to the K plus lower order terms. So if you know about the GJMS operators, you, you're, you're hitting them on the nail with, with these things. That, explaining that requires uh, going beyond what I want to talk about today. Okay, so, <coughs> okay, so finally, I wanted to say a little bit about uh, the extension problem, which turns out to be related to this, to these tangential operators. So, uh, <coughs> all right, so let's start over here. <coughs> uh, or do I? Maybe I'll. Yeah, I'll leave this stuff in the middle and work on the sides. <coughs> Okay, so I don't want to look too serious at these boundary problems, but let me, let me sort of start it. So, <coughs> I'll just call it the extension problem <coughs> and asymptotics. Okay, so, so our motivation is that I dot D F equals zero um, means that in the bulk we're going to have this satisfying, right? So, <coughs> well, this, this is in the case where J is constant, uh, blah, blah, blah. But actually, it, you can do this more generally. So we're just going to look at this I dot D problem. But that's our motivation, so it's a sort of good problem. So I want to talk about what we called solutions of the first kind. 
let me tell you what the problem is. So the, the problem is, um, well, let me, let me so begin <coughs> uh, with <coughs> some sort of, I'll call it F bar, some sort of um, <coughs> uh, section of the tractor bundle of some weight W naught um, along sigma. <coughs> and we want to extend it off so it solves this problem, but at least formally. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> let um, F naught be a smooth extension, just some, some extension. <coughs> Same way. <clears throat> okay, so I want to extend it at least to a neighborhood um, of, of the boundary. So initially we start with something on the boundary. I take a smooth extension of something with the same weight. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, so that's something one can just do. So the problem, <clears throat> as I'll phrase it, is um, to find Fi in uh, in here, so it'll be sections of tractors uh, of weight W naught minus I uh, on M, so that FL, which is defined to be equal to F naught plus F1 times sigma, perhaps I'm going to put those on that side for some reason, sigma f1 plus sigma squared f2 plus and so on up to uh, sigma to the l f l <coughs> uh, solves i dot d f equals order sigma to the l for l in the natural numbers union infinity basically as high as possible. That's the problem we want to solve. Okay, so, so it's formally solving the problem in that sense. It's really a shortage of long talk now. <clears throat> Okay, so here's a lemma, which is going to be the main point, actually. So suppose um, FL <coughs> solves it um, to this order. We, we want to go to the next order. Solves to order L. <coughs> then the claim is if uh, L is not equal to h naught minus 2, which is going to be um, n plus 2 w naught minus 1. So remember, d is n plus 1 <coughs> for these purposes. Um, then there exists uh, an fl plus 1 such that basically we get to the next order. So fl plus 1. Uh, defined to be equal to the old FL plus sigma to the L plus 1, FL plus 1, <coughs> uh, solves I dot D FL plus 1 equals 0 mod order sigma to the L plus 1. <coughs> okay, so um, how do we see that? <clears throat> well, actually, before we do that, so then if that's the case, <clears throat> so what happens if this is not the case? So um, if, <clears throat> uh, on the other hand, if L equals H naught minus 2, <clears throat> then the extension 
<coughs> so then solving this problem, the getting this extension, um, is obstructed <coughs> by P L plus one F naught restricted to sigma. Um, maybe I had a bar over that. This is exactly this tangential operator that we constructed over here. <coughs> okay? <coughs> if this thing is zero, you can then continue the expansion, but um, you lose some uniqueness. So there's sort of, there's basically uniqueness by construction. Let me not write it down, but give the main idea. Oh dear, okay, I'm really writing too large. Okay, <coughs> just, just remember where this came from. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so the proof <clears throat> we want to look at um, well we want, we want this to be zero, but, but this will be zero if one over i squared of it is zero, or minus one over i squared of it is zero. So we can look at y acting on fl plus one. <coughs> and, you know, putting in what this is, this is fl um, plus, <coughs> plus y on uh, xl plus one, because sigma is x, remember, times <coughs> fl plus one. <clears throat> okay, and now you just use another one of these um, SL2 identities. <clears throat> so we have YFL, that's not changed, plus, <clears throat> and here we put the commutator, so YXL plus 1, <clears throat> sorry, commutator of that, FL plus 1, plus XL plus 1 times something. So we don't care, this is order sigma to the L plus 1. So that's a term that we're not going to worry about. <clears throat> um, then we just use another one of these SL2 identities. And it's actually really the same one that we use for the tangential operators, except with the roles of X and Y swapped. Okay, so it's the same identity really. <clears throat> now, this is equal to X to the L times something. <clears throat> Why? Well, we assumed that we'd solve the problem up to that order, right? So so y f l is x to the l times something, and we want to cancel that something with what happens here. This y takes away one of the x's, there's no doubt about that. Um, <clears throat> and what this identity tells us is we get x to the l here, l plus 1, um, <clears throat> h plus l. This is the h operator, f l plus 1. So plus this term that we don't care much about. <clears throat> so so we can eliminate this term by choosing that term if this is not zero, right? So it boils down to whether that's zero or not. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, okay, so we have H plus L, and then H on FL plus 1 is, um, well, it's H naught on FL plus 1. H naught is, is, the, is the one, that, the weight the, the thing had originally, but this has to, ha has to have a lower weight by L plus 1, because these have weight 1, right? So um, it's minus 2 L plus 1s <coughs> times, times that. <coughs> okay. So that's what H is on there, and we have to add L to that. So what we get overall is X to the L times this thing minus X to the L, something that's not zero, namely L plus 1. And then in here we get H naught minus L minus 2. <coughs> F L plus 1 plus order sigma to the L plus 1. Okay, so, so hence the claim that um, if H naught is not equal, uh, sorry, if L is, it, L is not equal to H naught minus 2, uh, then we're done. Or was, if I got it the right way around, yeah. L is not equal to H naught minus 2, we're done. <coughs> okay, so the first bit is, is, is proved. 
<clears throat> so what happens if um, what happens if h naught is equal to l minus two, or if sorry if l equals h naught minus two? <clears throat> By the way, when can this happen, right? So um, <clears throat> this requires some restrictions on the weight. L, L is some positive integer. If the weight is, um, you know, uh, pi on two or something like that, this is never going to be zero, right? So, so for generic weights, you can just solve it. <clears throat> for some weights, you can go wrong. Um, <clears throat> so, but then anyway, if this happens, then what we saw here is that <clears throat> when the Y hits this thing, it doesn't make any difference if you add x to the l plus 1 times something else. So, so if, the, if, if you have this coincidence of numbers, uh, then we have <coughs> that y uh, f to the l equals y f to the l <coughs> um, plus x to the l plus 1 f to the l plus 1 <coughs> mod uh, x to the l plus 1. Okay, so, <clears throat> so this thing is the obstruction to going on if it's not zero. We can't, we can't fix it by adding this term. Um, therefore, y uh, f to the l which we know by assumption is equal to x to the l times something, let's call it p, Right? This is the obstruction to continuing. <clears throat> okay, because we were trying to get rid of these terms one by one, and we've hit this one that we can't get rid of. So, if, but if this is zero, we can continue. So really, this is the obstruction, and we know it's x to the l times something, and I've called the something p. So what is p, right? So now we, we, can, we can pick off these x's. So really, p you should think of as being the obstruction for continuing. <clears throat> okay, but I can pick off these x's by hitting it with more y's. So, so what you do is you apply y to the l to that. <clears throat> That's just the right number to take those off. And it turns out you, you, you don't get 0 here, but what you get is that you get y to the l of y. So you get y to the l plus 1. If L, so there were sort of brackets around the, uh, <coughs> uh, equals some number times P, and the number is not equal to zero. <coughs> but this, it turns out that this was exactly the weight that made this tangential. So, so this is the, so the weights are um, uh, 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 such that. <coughs> that uh, y to the l plus 1 <coughs> uh, f l equals p to this l plus 1. <coughs> um, well, now applied to f l, but, but this thing, this is a tangential operator, so you may as well apply it to f0 <coughs> along sigma. Yeah, so there's some detail there that, that, you know, the weights really work out such that this happens that I haven't, haven't um, written down for you. But basically, if you check the weights, this turns out to be exactly right. So this, this other thing goes wrong when this ex exactly has the weight that this power of y gives this tangential operator. And so, <coughs> so that's the thing that obstructs you continuing. So, <coughs> so in, the, in the Einstein case, for instance, and when you start off with densities of, of the right weight, the obstruction con to continuing is exactly one of these GJMS operators on the boundary. Um, <clears throat> now, you can continue with log terms, e even using this calculus. So you can uh, soup the calculus up to deal with log terms. Of course, you can't just deal with SL2 identities, because log isn't part of SL2 language. But, um, but yeah, but you can prove that uh, the required identities and put log terms in. And so... Um, this, this operator would then, on, on that term, would then become a coefficient of a log term. And then you can continue the, the um, ex expansion from there on with the log term. 
But in either case, you can compute all the asymptotics. And this is only solutions of the first kind, because we started off with just some density on the boundary and did this. So you can also try taking sigma to some power times f, and then you get a second type of solution. And you get a certain power, and these turn out to be, um, it, so the, so the one, uh, solution you get from this, and the other solution that you get, <coughs> not counting when you need logs, so the sort of, <laughs> the sort of three types of cases, so normally, you have solutions like this, and then you have another solution with just the power of uh, sigma out the front. Or you can, for certain weights, namely when this trouble occurs, you have also have log terms. But just forgetting that, this, th these, these, um, these powers work out so you know, in this conformal picture, so you exactly get the same sort of um, solutions that are looked at in the scattering program. So it ends up agreeing with with the, the things that uh, turn up when they do this in scattering, use this initial equation and all those sorts of things. So I'll, I'll stop there, because that, that becomes part of a long story to <laughs> put all the detail in.